comrades and welcome to today's Omali Tommy Sunday study featuring chairman Amalia Shetela. My name is Akile Anai, the director of agitation and propaganda for the African People's Socialist Party, as well as your MC for this morning. Make sure to hit that like button and share this video on the platform that you're viewing from. This week, chairman Amalia Shetela continues a study on dialectical materialism. He will read from Materialism and the Dialectical Method by Maurice Cornforth, starting on page 15 with the subhead Materialism and Idealism, Opposed Ways of Interpreting Every Question. The study materials have been linked in the Facebook and YouTube descriptions for your benefit. For the first hour, the chairman will review the study materials, and in the second hour, we'll open it up to you, our live viewers, to ask your questions. It's my honor now to introduce our leadership, the leader of the African nation and the worldwide African revolution, Chairman Amalia Shetela. Uhuru, Chairman. Uhuru, and uh, I want to express appreciation to you, Comrade uh, Director Kile Anai, for uh, the introduction and for uh, the incredible work that you do from your office. Uh, a Department of Agitation and Propaganda, the, the work that you lead there. And I want to uh, welcome all of you to today's study. As you know, we've been looking at this issue of dialectical materialism uh, for a couple of weeks now. And um, I'm going to try and expedite the process, though I really want to caution you that it is extremely important uh, to continue to study this and to look at the work that we are referencing and short in short order, we will have made a document available uh, that uh, is uh, more significant than the document that I'm referencing. As you will see, uh, we use um, a text by Maurice Cornforth on uh, materialism and the dialectical method. That's what it's called. It was written uh, in the 1950s, early 50s, and Cornforth was a member of the uh, British uh, Communist Party that uh, had extraordinary limitations, but I won't blame that on the fact that they were located in England, or, or I won't make that a distinguishing feature from most of the other parties uh, that consider themselves Marxist. So even as we go through this, what we really are going to be talking about is African internationalism, which is a worldview, which is a philosophy that, that is based on the investigation, uh, uh, based on the method of investigation and analysis as referred to as dialectical materialism. And uh, when applied to uh, society or investigation and ana analysis of society is referred to as historical materialism. These are terms that come from Karl Marx and Frederick Engels in particular. And uh, though uh, 
uh, Marx had never considered himself or never called himself a Marxist. And as I, I have read that, at least on one occasion, I had to make the statement that all I can say is I'm not a Marxist. Uh, I don't think it was uh, some kind of uh, uh, effort to uh, self-negation, but I think it was just to say that many people who call themselves Marxists have a different uh, worldview and a different uh, uh, belief system than what I uh, have uh, promoted. And this takes us to another problem, a difficulty, uh, complications of uh, the Cornforth uh, and, and uh, who characterize dialectical materialism, uh, not uh, simply as a method of investigation and analysis, but he characterizes as Marxism. He talks about it as a philosophy. And we say that uh, that is wrong, that that we are not Marxists, but we value uh, the methods of investigation and analysis called um, dialectical materialism, that uh, much of which is attributed to uh, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels in particular, and then uh, to others who followed uh, in their wake of like V.I. Lenin, uh, 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 and perhaps even uh, Mao Zedong, uh, who uh, define themselves as, as Marxists uh, and Marxist-Leninist, uh, et cetera. So uh, we say that uh, uh, the, the difference, a difference is that uh, in order to be a Marxist, one gets trapped with the conclusions of Marx. And what we've done is use this method of investigation and analysis called dialectical materialism, actually, uh, in, in to apply it to an actual investigation and analysis of our uh, situation as African people. And we've come to different kinds of conclusions, uh, some of which contradict uh, conclusions and a way of viewing the world uh, that Karl Marx, uh, uh, that, that was attributed to Karl Marx and sometimes through self-attribution. So I just wanted to make that comment and just say, comrades, please uh, take this discussion seriously and take the, the question of philosophy seriously. Uh, you want to know the worldview of anyone uh, who uh, puts uh, himself or herself forward uh, as a leader of our struggle. And what we've seen in uh, the recent period is uh, in some due to the 50 years of work that we've done as the party in terms of developing uh, of, of this worldview of African internationalism uh, uh, on, in the, in the uh, process of actually engaging in revolutionary struggles, uh, transforming uh, the world that we live in, uh, creating all kinds of institutions and uh, the developing the party and its structures as well. Uh, uh, we've seen uh, as partially as, as a consequence of that, because uh, we've always had the view uh, that uh, philosophy is meaningless if, if it's not something that can be applied in the world. If it can't be implemented, it doesn't mean anything to, uh, uh, except it can be diversionary. And so that, uh, this work that we've done over this last period of time engaged in actual struggle at a time where the African revolution had been crushed uh, militarily uh, all around the world, this that we've been doing, uh, and also the conditions and circumstances in the world uh, pushing now uh, some of the questions uh, that we have uh, pursued and projected uh, over the last uh, 50 years to complete the Black Revolution of the 60s, uh, they are now uh, reaching the surface and they are now uh, being discussed. And as if they have, the, that, as this, if this discussion was happening all along, sometimes they've resurrected stuff that was written 40 years ago or 30 years or 20 years ago uh, to talk about our conditions. There's the, the, the it's the situation of this discussion around uh, colonialism. You see it uh, penetrating so many, so many uh, venues now. Colonialism, settler colonialism, that's been discussed uh, frequently. Uh, you hear people who talk about parasitic capitalism now. Uh, that's been spoken of uh, repeatedly. <clears throat> and uh, you, the, the the issue is not just colonialism, uh, but this is this surrounds the entire issue the question of, uh, of dialectical materialism, materialism versus idealism, uh, where uh, uh, the quote unquote spiritual uh, uh, takes precedence seen as prior to, uh, where the question of racism, the ideas in, in the heads of uh, white people uh, is the dominant thing that 
that uh, many of these forces have concentrated on up until now, when it's not as uh, fashionable uh, to do so. Um, in other words, we're talking about careers. Some people who find themselves as careers being Black, being in the movement, but have no intention of making the revolution. In fact, we call some of them uh, pop uh, uh, ideologues, uh, popular uh, philosophy. Uh, so whatever is trending at the moment, uh, from toxic masculinity to uh, insert, in, uh, uh, inter, inter, how do you call it, Intersex, intersectionality to, uh, uh, you know, there's other popular phenomenon that, that have, uh, that have dominated uh, uh, for the long time as a substitute for revolution. Uh, many folk uh, uh, are like that. They're careerists, or some are like that. Now, I don't mean people in general. I mean people who presume to be leaders. And uh, so you hear uh, some of the language now uh, that we have been using, and you will hear uh, some attempt to modify uh, the concepts of revisionism of African internationalism, but it's important for you to have a grip on this question of philosophy on uh, uh, dialectical and historical materialism uh, from, the ver from the perspective of uh, uh, and in process of investigating uh, the development of this whole social system uh, and its relationship to Africa and African people in the world. And therein, uh, you'll find the germ of, of the uh, investigation for uh, the nature of the social system and how it affects people overall. This is African internationalism. This is a consequence of the study, uh, uh, investigation, and analysis of, uh, of society as it has emerged subsequent to the attack on Africa, uh, the uh, colonial enslavement of African people and the, um, uh, the um, uh, manifestation or, uh, of, of colonialism as a world economy, uh, emergence of colonialism as, as a global economy around the world. So you're going to see and hear folk who want to modify that, who want to put forth uh, using the same words, et cetera, but uh, many of these will be uh, nothing but uh, 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 people who are fundamentally connected to an idealistic view of the world. They are anti-racist. Their struggle has been revolving around racism for a long period of time. And while that may seem like an innocent or innocuous uh, 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 observation, it's more than that. It has practical kinds of conclusions. Uh, because the, to be involved and to be uh, to move uh, with a struggle that's uh, essentially dealing with racism, uh, that's racism as the problem, the ideas in the heads of white people is the problem, it presupposes a solution for what is impacting Africa and African people globally and the masses of oppressed people around the world, it presupposes that there is a solution inside the system itself. So you can improve your situation, change your situation uh, by fighting against racism or the ideas in the heads of white people as opposed to changing the world that is the basis, the foundation for those ideas, the thing that gave rise to those ideas. So it's not uh, just a, 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 an empty discussion and a play on semantics or something to that effect. And that's why it's really important to pay attention to this study and to continue the process of studying this, because if you do, uh, you will be able to discern, and I'm gonna try and help you as quickly as I can to discern uh, the difference uh, between African internationalism, uh, the way of looking at the world, the way of investigating and analyzing the world uh, as it relates to the real uh, conditions and situation of African oppressed people around the world. And, uh, and that view that uh, tries to move people in the direction of perfecting the system of our oppression and exploitation by hiding the contradiction, by saying that the contradiction is what white people think about us, whether, they, whether it's institutional thinking or something to that effect, as opposed to uh, the nature of the system and the relationship that we have that has to be overturned. So that's what I wanted to just uh, say, and I think it's important. And uh, we're going now, as it uh, has already been stated, uh, to, uh, to page, uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, to page 15, and we're looking at materialism and idealism. 
And, and I'm going to read, uh, and I want you to remember what I've said about how uh, Marxists, including Cornforth, uh, put forth the notion that, uh, that uh, dialectic materialism method, uh, or the method of investigation analysis is a philosophy, as a, uh, and they call that the same thing as Marxism, uh, as opposed to uh, 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 recognizing that it is just that. It is a tool, it's a method of investigation and analysis. It is not the philosophy itself. The philosophy is born of a scientific approach that is uh, a dialectic and historical met uh, materialist method of investigation. So I want to say that, and I want to say that uh, as I do this, I will quote people who talk about Marxism being this and Marxism being that, uh, but I want you to be able uh, to perceive that in those cases where I do not uh, uh, call attention to it, what I'm characterizing as Marxism is really African internationalism. And I can do that because I'm saying uh, that, uh, Afro that the, invest the method of investigation is, is what we have used to come to conclusion and not the conclusion uh, that Marx or somebody else may ha have come to using this method. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and expedite this process. And because this is not just a discussion we're having uh, uh, for uh, the purpose of making someone more competent in debating obscure and abstract, uh, purely abstract ideas. Uh, we are involved in trying to change the world to make a, a revolution. And that's the thing that makes the method of investigation and analysis important to us uh, 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 in, in the process of, of solving real problems uh, that, uh, that the world is, uh, is, uh, is uh, confronted with and dealing with on a regular basis. So materialism and idealism, remember that materialism uh, is opposed to idealism since while idealism holds that the spiritual or ideal is prior to the material, materialism holds that matter is prior. This difference manifests itself in, a, in opposed ways of interpreting and understanding every question. And so in opposed attitudes in practice, while idealism takes many subtle forms in the writings of philosophers, it is at bottom a continuation of belief in the, super, in the superstition. And uh, it involves belief in two worlds, in the ideal or the supernatural world over against the real material world. And uh, for example, you hear this ideal of Western democracy is what we was thrust upon us all the time. The, so use Western democracy is this ideal world, and this is the priority, this is the main thing versus colonialism, uh, racism versus colonial reality. And you see this in play all the time, uh, because when people uh, who are the thinking representatives of white power and their minions and their followers who uh, are the well-bred, well-educated uh, uh, people, including some Negroes, they, uh, well, they have, they are forced to by reality, uh, by what's happening in the real world, by the murders, the vicious uh, uh, starvation and other kinds of things that happen to colonized people that America is responsible or the United States government is responsible for. What they will do is they will say, yes, we know those are problems, but the idea uh, uh, that we have uh, this Western democracy, it doesn't always live up to what it's supposed to do, or it takes time to get there, but this is the idea. This is the thing that makes it so significant. And I just saw something, I think it may have been in the New York Times on yesterday, because the New York State Assembly, uh, especially with the influence and, and, and leadership of Comrade uh, Charles Barron, uh, who uh, has been a state assemblyman, uh, and has just uh, throughout uh, just voted to get rid of the statue of uh, Thomas Jefferson because he owned uh, African human beings. This statue is there uh, in, in the state assembly. He owned African human beings uh, because uh, uh, he was a rapist, a pedophile, uh, who uh, raped at least 13-year-old uh, Sally Hemings and must have been many more uh, from whom he, you know, he made babies with this, with this child uh, who uh, was a slave and who didn't have the ability, where are all of the Me Too people when it comes to Sally Hemings? But that's another story. And so uh, I've seen uh, an article that was written by someone 
who was saying <laughs> that, uh, yeah, we know all of the bad stuff that Jefferson did, he owned black people, et cetera, et cetera. But Martin Luther King and, and, and uh, 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 other people who we respect as, uh, as African people, uh, they, 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 they were people who would, have, who, who would have not been involved in throwing that statue out. And they say because, because Jefferson uh, said some things uh, and they would quote some statements that Jefferson made about freedom and democracy and what have you uh, that influenced uh, 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 other people, black people around the world. And uh, though he had these inadequacies and then they would take parts of speeches from King, parts of speeches uh, from uh, 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 other African people that reference some of the statements that's in the Declaration of Independence or something else that's attributed to, uh, to Thomas Jefferson. And they would say, see, uh, this is why it was wrong to throw it out because while he did this thing in real world, he was a slave owner, he was a, he, they don't say he was a pedophile. Uh, they, they, uh, 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 when, they, when they're able to say that, but they're saying, but the main thing is not what he did in the world, is the ideas. Uh, and so this is a whole uh, thing about idealism, uh, a continuation in the belief in the, in the supernatural. It, it, it's, it involves a belief in two worlds, in the ideal or the supernatural world over against the real and the material world. So the ideas that Jefferson believed in, they, they trumped uh, the actual things that he did and the consequences uh, of, of his practice in the real world. So in essence, idealism, this is Cornforth that we're reading now, uh, idealism is a conservative reactionary force and its reactionary influence is demonstrated in practice. African internationalism adopts a consistent standpoint of militant materialism. So uh, materialism and idealism, opposed ways of interpreting every question. Our philosophy, this is what uh, uh, is quoting Stalin now in Corn for, our philosophy is called dialectical materialism, says Stalin, because it, its approach to the phenomena of nature, its method of studying and apprehending them, is dialectical while its interpretation of the phenomena of, phenomena of nature, its conception of these phenomena, its theory is materialistic. So materialism is not a dogmatic system. It is rather a way of interpreting, conceiving, or explaining every question. The materialist way of interpreting events, of conceiving of things and their interconnections is opposed to the idealist way of interpreting and conceiving of them. Materialism is oppo opposed to idealism. With every question, there are materialist and idealist ways of interpreting it, materialist and ideal, idealist ways of trying to understand it. So that's important uh, for us to comprehend. Thus, materialism and idealism are not two opposed abstract theories about the nature of the world of small concern to ordinary practical folk. They are opposed ways of interpreting and understanding every question. And consequently, they express opposite approaches in practice and lead to very different conclusions in terms of practical activity. And I'm hoping that what comes through this discussion uh, is recognition that something that we take so much for granted in terms of what we see and how we interpret them is not is, is, is something that we've learned uh, uh, under a, a particular social system. Uh, that uh, defines, interprets uh, the world based on uh, its own interests. And we uh, uh, can be uh, caught up in this worldview too. You've heard some people uh, say something to the effect that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm a black and so I understand this and that because I'm African, but it doesn't mean that you understand it. It still could be that you have a, a, you, you have a, a, a philosophically idealistic uh, way of, uh, of seeing things and a metaphysical approach to things. So, uh, for example, I've used, uh, uh, I've used uh, the, the fact that uh, you can go to Miami, uh, you can go to the world, but let's, we can go to Miami and uh, uh, it, where there are, there's a large uh, population, sector of the population with the recent connection to, to Haiti, uh, where extraordinary revolutionary movement uh, developed. And you can go there and uh, you can actually get direction from an African who will tell you that the black people live on this side and, and over this area 
and then the Haitians live over this area. So despite the fact that they use the term black uh, as a physiological uh, to define something about the physiognomy of, uh, of African people, they make this distinction that what's called uh, the Haitian and what's called the black people trumps the reality of who we are, that if you didn't hear uh, one of us speak, you wouldn't be able to distinguish one from the other because they are the same. And the same thing is true of Africans in general. Africans are scattered throughout the world, forcibly uh, scattered throughout the world, and locked into a system uh, of, uh, of, of uh, subsequent to that happening in a system that explains itself uh, with a superstructure that will allow us to be a Ghanaian, a Congolese, a Jamaican, a Trinidadian, a Black American, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, and, and so the ideal, this is what idealism, the, the spiritual or something like that trumps the material uh, reality that we're living with. That's why it's important to, uh, to come to terms uh, with African internationalism that explains the world just as it is. So we say that uh, the materialist uh, and idealism are two, this is corn for, Two oppose, uh, are not two oppose abstract theories about the nature of the world, a small concern to ordinary practical folk. They oppose ways of viewing and understanding every question and consequently, they express opposite approach in practice and lead to very different conclusions in terms of practical activity. And I think sometimes uh, this group of uh, Africans who uh, call themselves uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, how do you, how do they catch descendants of slaves and uh, who live in America and therefore uh, we are the only ones who should get uh, quote unquote reparations uh, uh, from the American government uh, as opposed to uh, other Africans. That's why we have struggles with uh, some people who will say that since we've been over here for a long time, uh, we are no longer Africans, which is what the white man has said for a long time without our intervention. Uh, but somehow. Uh, we are new Africans. And you think about this new African question and it falls into the same category that white people invented to talk about the invasion of, uh, of the Americas. And, uh, and it's characterized, they call it the new world. Uh, uh, and and uh, that there's a, there's a new beginning here that's separate uh, and distinct uh, from uh, the uh, historical process that brought it uh, into existence. So. Uh, so we say, uh, nor uh, materialism and idealism, Cornford again, are they, nor are they, as some uh, use the term, opposite moral attitudes, the one high-minded, uh, the other base and self-seeking. Self if we use uh, the, the terms uh, like this, we shall never understand the opposition between uh, capitalist and materialist conceptions. For this way of speaking is, as Engel said, nothing but an un unpardonable concession to the traditional Philistine, Philistine prejudice against the word materialism, resulting from the long continued defamation by the uh, priest. By the word materialism, the Philistine understands, a, understands gluttony, drunkenness, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, arrogance, cupidity, miserliness, miserliness profit, hunting, and stock exchange swindling. In short, all the filthy virtues, vir vices of which, which he himself uh, indulges in private. By the word idealism, he understands the belief in virtue and universal philanthropy and in a general way, a, a better world of which he boasts before others. So the, the bourgeoisie and its thinkers have taken these terms of uh, 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 idealism and materialism uh, uh, as terms that uh, disguise what their real relationship is uh, to peoples around the world and uh, makes it more, makes it complicates our ability to see them. I'm thinking of a song, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a popular singer, a popular performer called Madonna, I think made a song, the, A Material Girl or something like that, that's based on an assumption uh, too. Uh, of, uh, of uh, this materialism really being kind of naughty, naughty and bad and, and idealism uh, philosophically is the better. But before trying to define materialism and idealism in general terms, let us consider how these two ways of understanding things are expressed in relation to certain simple and familiar questions. This will, this will help us to grasp the significance 
of the distinction between a materialist and idealist interpretation. This is Cornforth we're reading now. First, uh, let us consider a very familiar and, and natural phenomenon, uh, a, a thunderstorm. What causes thunderstorms? An idealist way of answering this question is to say that thunderstorms are due to the anger of gods. Being angry, he arranges for lightning and thunderbolts to descend upon mankind. The materialist way of understanding thunderstorms is opposed to this. The materialist would try to explain and understand thunderstorms as being solely due to what we call natural forces. For example, ancient materialists suggested that far from thunderstorms being due to the anger of gods, they were caused by material particles in the clouds banging against one another. That this particular explanation is wrong is not the point. The point is that it was an attempt at materialist as opposed to idealist explanation. Nowadays, a great deal more is known about thunderstorms arising from the scientific uh, investigation of the natural forces involved. Knowledge uh, remains very incomplete, but at all events, enough is known to make it quite clear that the explanation must be on materialist lines so that the idealist explanation has, has become thoroughly dis discredited. It will be seen that while the idealist explanation tries to relate the phenomenon to the explain to some spiritual causes, in this case, the anger of God, the materialist explanation relates to, to, uh, to uh, how do we see it? I'm, I'm, hmm, how did I get this place? I'm sorry, comrades. Uh, I'm reading from two different kinds of documents here. Um, uh, that relates to material causes. So we make this distinction that the, the idealist expl explanation tries to relate the phenomenon to explain to some spiritual causes. In this case, the anger of God, the materialist explanation relies on material causes. And this is important because this is one of the problems that people should have uh, uh, with philosophical idealism, whether it's in a form of religion or anything else. Because if in fact uh, it's God that has done this, then it's left out of the hands of human beings. So we, there is no real reason to investigate anymore how to deal with it because the answer is simple, God did it. Uh, and, uh, but if a materialist can be wrong in terms of the conclusion that the materialist has come to, but the fact that materialist uh, is the means by which we explain this phenomenon uh, helps us to continue to uh, come up with a better and more correct solution. In this example, most educated people today would agree in accepting uh, the materialist uh, interpretation. This is Cornforth again. This is, this is because they generally accept the scientific explanation of natural phenomena. And uh, every advance in natural science is an advance in the materialist understanding of nature. Uh, let us uh, take a second example, this time one arising out of social life. For example, for instance, why are they rich and poor? This is a question which many people ask, especially poor people. The most straightforward idealist answer to this question is to say simply, it is because God made them so. It is the will of God that some should be rich and others poor. Uh, but less straightforward idealist explanations are more in vogue. For example, it is because some men are careful and far-sighted and these husband their resources and grow rich while others are thriftless and stupid, and these remain poor. Uh, those who favor this type of explanation say that it is all due to eternal human nature. The nature of man and, and, and of society is such that the, the distinction between rich and, poor, rich and poor necessarily arises. Uh, just as in the case of the thunderstorm, so in the case of the rich and poor, the idealists seek for some spiritual cause, not uh, not, if not in the will of God, the divine mind, then in certain innate characteristics of the human mind. And the materialist, on the other hand, seeks to, seeks to reason in the material economic conditions of social life. If society is div divided into rich and poor, it is because the production of the material means of life is so ordered that some have possession of the land and means of production while the rest have to work for them. However hard they may work and however much they may scrape and save, the non-possessors will remain poor while the possessors grow rich on the fruits of their labor. And I think that uh, this is really important. And uh, 
and we don't have enough time to go into deep uh, uh, discussion as I, as I would prefer, but when, when you look at Cornforth making the statement, uh, using the basis of the discussion, uh, the question of dialectic and historical materialist uh, investigation and analysis, uh, it is uh, significant that he does not uh, extend this discussion uh, to the relationship between Africa and Europe, uh, between Africans and white people. Well, you know, the glaring example of poverty and wealth, uh, the glaring example is not between uh, workers and bosses uh, in, in, in America or in England or in Europe in general, the glaring example of poverty and wealth is that which exists between the black man or black people and white people uh, exists between the African and Europeans, between those uh, who uh, colonize around the world. He doesn't use this as an example. And if you use this uh, as an example, then you would have to conclude using dialectical and historical materialist methods of investigation and analysis that the profound critical contradiction uh, is a colonial contradiction. Uh, and the history of the rise of capitalism through colonial expropriation, it offers a, like a splendid universal example of this truth. That is African internationalism. More so than understood by Cornforth and Marx, uh, parasitism, colonial dialectic, uh, uh, oppressed nations versus oppressor nation, this is what we are looking at, parasitism. The colonial di dialectic of oppressed nations versus oppressor nations. This is a profound contradiction. On, and then back to Cornforth on such questions, therefore, and this is important because you're going to hear uh, many people, as I mentioned early, who, uh, earlier, uh, uh, who are effectively uh, uh, careerists, uh, who take uh, popular terms and goals that seem to be trending. Uh, in order to uh, forward their career of being black, uh, something to that effect, uh, and and uh, they would try to parrot a particular political line, and you will see uh, that the missing factor, of course, is that uh, at best they are inconsistent African internationalists. Uh, at worst, uh, they uh, are, are those uh, who would revise African internationalism uh, to hide uh, their. Uh, their uh, unity uh, with our oppressors, which is uh, uh, informed by a whole different kind of worldview. So back to uh, Cornforth. On such questions, therefore, the difference between a materialist and idealist uh, conception uh, 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 can be very important. And the difference is important, not merely in theoretical, but in practical sense. A materialist conception of thunderstorms, for example, helps us to take precautions against them, such as fitting buildings with lighting conductors. But if our explanation of thunderstorms is idealist, all we can do is watch and pray. If we accept an idealist account of the existence of rich and poor, all we can do is accept the existing state of affairs, uh, uh, rejoicing in our superior status and, and bestowing a little charity if we are rich uh, and cursing our fate if we are poor. Uh, but uh, armed with the materialist understanding of society, armed with African internationalism, Mr. Cornforth, I would say, we can begin to see uh, the way to change society. And because uh, what happens is that uh, we see uh, these uh, uh, forces who um, make uh, uh, assumptions, philosophical assumptions rooted uh, in idealism, uh, 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 showing uh, how wonderful they are, uh, by bestowing a little charity uh, on African people, even uh, uh, this so-called uh, kidnapping of our children that they call adoptions, whether that's inside the colonial countries themselves, like the United States, where uh, a little black child owned by white people uh, as adoption become good uh, topic fodder for cocktail parties, or you know, uh, you know. Uh, you know, just this beneficent charitable colonizer who established NGOs and things like this. They don't challenge the social system itself because they, its philosophical idealism does not say, does not inform anyone that the contradiction is not how we are treated in an unjust uh, society, just to use the, you know, uh, a term, uh, but the existence of that society itself and the fact that we have to try and live within it. 
so the solution is not to be found uh, in making this society uh, 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 more uh, just when it, the very foundation uh, is in genocide and colonialism. The solution is overturning that. That's, that's what we mean when we say it's not just uh, some kind of uh, 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 a foray into uh, purely abstract uh, discussions when we talk about uh, 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 philosophy and revolutionary philosophy and African internationalism uh, as the only meaningful response to our condition and how we understand it as compared to some forms of idealism that most of us, uh, most of the so-called leaders uh, uh, bow to. So uh, it is clear therefore that while some may have a vested interest in idealism, it is in the interest of the great majority to learn to think and to understand things in a materialist way. You can see how the oppressor would have a vested interest in idealism, a vested interest in us fighting against racism, which is to get them to like us uh, or to become more like them, <clears throat> as opposed to uh, overturning the system, that they have a vested interest in that. They have a vested interest in obscuring the relationships that exist in this country, especially during the height of profound uh, struggles and contradictions by obscuring uh, these uh, uh, contradictions, uh, uh, the basis of these contradictions by saying stuff like Black Lives Matter, <clears throat> which, uh, uh, and this hopefully helps uh, you and the party and others who are familiar with us to understand that our opposition to the term Black Lives Matter is not because we don't think it's a catchy slogan, but because it's misdirecting, it's imposing an idealist uh, 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 worldview, uh, it is reinforcing an idealist worldview uh, as opposed to anything that will say uh, that will lead us in the direction of change in relationship. That's why we offer as a counter to Black Lives Matter, Black Power Matters. You have to have power. Uh, how do you make that happen? This is the question that we are not confronted with. So you won't hear, you will hear Joe Biden say Black Power Matter. He is representative of the most reactionary, most uh, desp despicable uh, uh, bourgeoisie, white nationalist colonizer, he can say uh, Black Lives Matter, but you won't hear him say Black Power Matters, or maybe he would uh, under certain circumstances if that term, uh, if we're in a place where that term can be used to mask the fact of neo-colonialism, that is to say white power in a black face, but, uh, but a real uh, investigation uh, 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 an African internationalist investigation will help us to make that distinction as well. So I'm uh, moving forward. Uh, uh, how then, this is corn for, uh, can we define materialism and idealism uh, and the differences between them in general terms so as to define the essence of the question? Uh, and this was done by Engels, uh, this is corn for, uh, uh, the great, basic quoting angles, the great basic question of all philosophy, especially of modern philosophy, is that concerning the relation of thinking and being. The answers which the philosophers have given this question split them into two great camps. Those who asserted the primacy of spirit to nature, and therefore in the last instance, assume world creation in some form or another, comprise the camp of idealism those who asserted the primacy of spirit to nature and therefore in the last instance assumed world creation in some form or another comprised the camp of idealism. The others who regarded nature as primary belonged to the various schools of materialism. This is English. Uh, uh, idealism is the way of interpreting things which regards the spiritual as prior to the material. Whereas materialism regards the material as prior. Idealism supposes that everything material is dependent on and determined by something spiritual. Whereas materialism recognizes that everything spiritual is dependent on and determined by some, something material. And this difference manifests itself both in general philosophical conceptions of the world as a whole and in conceptions of particular things and events. Uh, at bottom, idealism is, is religion. Uh, uh, idealism is clericalism, wrote Lenin. All idealism is a continuation of the religious approach to questions, even though particular idealist theories have shed their religious skins. 
Idealism is inseparable from superstition, belief in the supernatural, the mysterious and unknowable. Uh, materialism, on the other hand, seeks for explanation in terms belonging to the material world, in terms of factors which, can, we, which we can verify, understand, and control. Uh, uh, the roots of idealist conception of things are then the same uh, uh, as those of religion. Let me just, uh, I, I participated, I think it was on yesterday, in a, an invaluable uh, conference um, uh, hosted uh, uh, by comrades who engage in a critical struggle around the Bethesda burial ground in Maryland, where uh, one of the many locations in the United States and uh, in particular right now, because it's a practice all over the world, uh, where uh, African burial sites uh, are being desecrated, uh, paved over parking lots made of them, uh, uh, the dead, uh, 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 the dead, the coffins and things like that being uh, excavated and, you know, and, and dumped uh, uh, into waste areas. So, so uh, the Bethesda uh, coalition uh, pulled together this international conference because they correctly tied uh, the question of these burial grounds to the issue of land. And under the influence of, uh, of uh, Marsha Coleman out of, out of Bayou, one of the leaders of this coalition, uh, they hosted a, a, an international conference, a conference on, uh, on uh, international um, uh, theft of, uh, of, of black lands, of, uh, et cetera. And uh, the, the thing about this conference was really interesting to me uh, because uh, uh, there's very serious uh, spiritual and re uh, religious uh, uh, a connotation put to it. In fact, uh, Comrade Marsha Coleman Adebayo, her husband, uh, is, uh, is a pastor, a Christian pastor. Um, uh, and then there were various uh, other spiritualists, people who, I say spiritualists, and I don't want to be misunderstood there, uh, but people uh, of religious persuasions uh, who, uh, you know, uh, were part of the program uh, throughout much of the program. It's very important, very good. But the thing is that what Marsha Coleman Adebayo had done is elevated the struggle of African people through this conference uh, to make it necessary uh, for people now to be looking at the question of land uh, as it's related to our conditions of existence. And when you do that, uh, you uh, pull it in a place of your own earth, on the planet, the material reality that we are confronted with. And the fact is that all of the spiritual stuff that, that came in that meeting, some connected to Africa, uh, some uh, connected to uh, assumptions of uh, Africa, uh, et cetera, and Christianity, all of these religious beliefs, all of these, these things uh, have their origin, they're, they're rooted in the question of the land. Uh, and uh, they're connected to the land. They're connected to the fact that human beings uh, enter into certain kind of relations to produce. And the relations of production uh, and the production, the, the forces of production, what are the forces of production? The critical, the most critical components of the forces of production is what? Land uh, and people. And what we live in as African people is an expropriation uh, of uh, a capture of the forces of production uh, of Africa, uh, of African people. That's land, the whole African continent. That's land, every place we've been dispersed to uh, uh, forcibly as a part of the African nation, whether it's in what they call it, whether it's in the Caribbean, uh, whether uh, it's in, in South America or North America, that theft of land, whether it's the, uh, this uh, uh, St. Louis, uh, Missouri, where there's an ongoing push of African people off the land or of uh, gentrification happening every place. The fact is that land, as Malcolm X told us, uh, revolution is based on land. That the, the fact is that you have to have land to live. Uh, land is where we produce everything that's necessary to exist. It is a critical component of the force of production as well as human beings. And so African people, land, and the, what we need to produce otherwise are constitute, constitute the forces of production. But what colonialism has done is capture uh, our land, capture our people, and fundamentally, However we characterize it, the struggle of black people uh, is a struggle uh, for, to liberate the forces of production. 
and the forces of production are material. They are land. That's our Africa. That's wherever we are, because everywhere we are, we've taken Africa with us and fighting to recreate uh, the Africa of freedom that we knew before we met imperialism or colonialism or the white man, if you will, uh, and then human beings. So here you have the, this, this is what the struggle against colonialism. But this is why this conference was so important, it had so many uh, uh, a, a very uh, uh, clever and, uh, and knowledgeable people, even uh, in this uh, sphere of religion, uh, because it gave us an opportunity, the connection of this two gave us an opportunity to be able to expound on the relationship of the spiritual, the ideas, uh, and, um, and, the, and, the, and the material, uh, the reality, the concrete reality. And it's in the process of African people engaging in production to feed, clothe, house ourselves, to improve our circumstances and situation that culture and other things like that emerge. And that the religion comes from this process. Uh, and if, if this is why in almost every place in the world, religious religion, uh, though uh, more or less the same in terms of it being philosophical idealism, idealist, uh, if left to itself, Religion uh, is, is based on uh, the conditions uh, that the people uh, 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 had to deal with to, to, uh, to feed, clothe, and house themselves, to produce and reproduce life. Uh, this is the fundamental uh, condition. This is the fundamental venture, material venture that African people uh, engaged in. And from this process, then ideas and religions and things like that, culture, uh, grow from that and not the other way around. As much as we loved Aretha Franklin, we are clear uh, that it was the struggle of Black people for freedom in the 1960s that's responsible for one of her most significant, most uh, 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 appreciated uh, 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 songs at the time that, that had uh, freedom, uh, freedom uh, as a, a critical articulation. Uh, that it was the struggle that gave rise to that and not the fact that she sang the song that, that took African people out fighting for freedom. And this is the material basis, the, the, the ideas, uh, the philosophy has a material, and that's why you will also find some of the most important works of uh, particularly some African artists, cultural workers, singers, and things like that, and other performers uh, happening during this time that was rich with revolutionary struggle. And it was reflected uh, in the art, uh, because the reality is that these ideas, these things have the basis in actual material uh, conditions and struggles. So, uh, so uh, materialism, we say, uh, on the other hand, seeks for explanation in terms belonging to the material world in terms of factors, which we can verify, understand, and control. Uh, the roots of idealist uh, conception of things they are then the same as those in religion. To believers, the conceptions in religion, uh, that is to say conceptions of supernatural spiritual beings generally seem to have their justification, not of course in any evidence of the senses, but in something which lies deep within the spiritual nature of man. And indeed uh, it is true, this is Cornforth we're reading, and indeed, it is true that these conceptions do have very deep roots in the historical development of human consciousness. But what is their origin? How did such conceptions arise in the first place? We can certainly not regard such conceptions as being the products as, as religion tells us of divine revelation or as arising from any other supernatural cause if we can find that they themselves have a natural origin. And such an origin, origin can indeed be traced. Conceptions of the supernatural and religious ideas in general owe their origin, first of all, to the helplessness and ignorance of men in the face of forces of nature, forces which man, men cannot understand are personified. They are represented as manifestations of the activity of spirits. For example, such alarming events as thunderstorms were, as we have seen, explained fantastically as due to the anger of gods. Again, such important phenomena as the growth of crops were put down to the activity of a spirit. It was believed that it was the corn spirit that made the corn grow. Uh, from the most primitive times, men personified natural forces in this way. With the birth of class society, when men were impelled to act by social relations which dominated them and which they did not understand, 
they further invented supernatural agencies doubling, as it were, uh, the state of society. The gods were invented superior to mankind, just as the kings and lords were superior to the common people. And uh, it's worth mentioning this whole, this whole concept of lords and what have you. When you look at King James and the Bible, uh, and you have, which is well, uh, written uh, 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 during this uh, era of uh, feudalism, uh, uh, you would have the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. You have this clear personification uh, of, uh, of the nobility uh, 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 as, as, as doubling, uh, 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 if you will. You have this doubling where, where uh, the God and what have you uh, uh, is connected uh, to society and social structures. So uh, we say from the most primitive time, men personified natural forces in this way with the birth of class society, when men were impelled to act by social relations which dominated them and which they did not understand, they further invented supernatural agencies doubling as it were the state of society. The gods were invented superior to mankind just as the kings and lords were superior to the common people. All religion and all idealism has, has at its heart this kind of doubling of the world. It is dualistic and invents a dominating, a dominating uh, ideal of supernatural world over against the real material world. I'm trying to see where I'm in terms of page, page numbers right now. Let's see. Okay. Um, but idealism uh, in, uh, uh, let's see. Do, 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 grasp of intellect. Uh, Okay, Yet very character characteristics of idealism are such antithesis as soul and body and God and man, the heavenly kingdom and the earthly kingdom, uh, the forms and ideas of things grasped by the intellect and the world uh, of material reality are perceptible uh, to the senses. So you have this doubling thing, the, the God and man, heavenly kingdom and the earthly kingdom, et cetera. This doubling of the world is carried to its furthest limits in subjective idealism. This is a, this is a, a you know, idealism, an iteration of idealism is called subjective idealism, which ends uh, by regarding the material, material world as a mere illusion and asserts that only the non-material world is real. Uh, the dualistic character of all idealism is most marked in subjective idealism which posits a complete antithesis between the mechanistic system uh, of the illusory uh, material world and the freedom of the higher non-material reality. This antithesis disguised as it often is behind allegedly scientific and empiricist theorizing characterizes all subjective idealist philosophies from Berkeley to John Dewey. For idealism, there's always a higher more real non-material world, which is prior to the material world, is its ultimate source and cause and to which the material world is subject. For materialism, on the other hand, there is one world, the materialist world, material world. And I think it's really important to understand this, that the idealists uh, will tell you that the world that you live in, uh, the, 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 the suffering that you experience, the expropriation of our value, the kicking us out of our communities, the police killings and things that are happening to us. That stuff, they, they, you know, idealism, uh, first of all, there's a form of idealism, subjective idealism, which will say that that doesn't even exist. And you hear expressions of this in the African community uh, that will tell you I'm free because I think I'm free, that you know, uh, regardless of everything that's happening around me, uh, the police just killed my mother, that I'm free because I think I'm free, that there's no relationship uh, between, uh, 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 you know, real relationship between uh, 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 what happens to me and what I'm living with and, and what's in my mind, except the fact that I think it, I think it. You've seen bumper stickers that says that something to the effect that uh, I think, therefore I am, which is uh, ridiculous, you know, because uh, the, the, re the response to that, of course, is that uh, you, 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 you are, 
and therefore you can think. Uh, and for idealism, there's always a higher corn forth again, more real, more material world, which, which is prior to the material world is this ultimate source and cause and to which the material world is subject. For materialism, on the other hand, there is one world, the material world. By idealism and philosophy, we mean that doctrine which says that beyond material, material reality, there's a higher spiritual reality in terms of which the material reality uh, is in the last analysis to be explained. And so sometimes Africans, we are victimized by that because this real world that we live in is so horrible, et cetera. So we assume that there must be uh, some, uh, uh, beyond this, there must be a, a higher spiritual reality. And that's the thing that even makes us susceptible uh, to uh, giving uh, charlatans and like preachers and things like that, all of our resources uh, for a better life uh, in, uh, in a, an after world. That, that, uh, that this real world is so horrible. Uh, and if we don't, you can't see a way out of it, uh, then ex except death. Death is something that we know is out of it. He's, he's, he's in a better life now. The, one of the common uh, refrains uh, from funerals is a better place now, uh, dead. Uh, uh, and that is the only conclusion that you come to when you've surrendered to uh, the inevitability of your oppression and what is happening to us and cannot see a way forward, cannot see a material basis for the suffering and therefore move toward a material solution to this. So we say that, I'm going forth, I'm reading again, I know I'm a little over, uh, but idealism in philosophy, we mean that any doctrine which says that beyond material, material reality, there's a higher spiritual reality in terms of which the material reality is in the last analysis to be explained. At this point, a few observations may be useful concerning some characteristic doctrines of modern bourgeois philosophy. For nearly 300 years, there has been put forth a ver variety of phil philosophy known as subjective idealism. This teaches that the material world does not exist at all. Nothing exists uh, but the sensations and ideas in our minds. And there is no external material reality co corresponding to them. And we run into people, who, very people who, <laughs> who are very clever, who've recently uh, 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 learned of this. They don't call it subjective idealism. They just call it being really smart. Uh, but you hear this again, and nothing really exists except what's in the mind. Uh, and, uh, and so, in, 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 and then again, uh, this subjective idealism is put uh, forward in the form of doctrine concerning knowledge. It denies that we can know anything about objective reality outside ourselves and, say, and says that we can have knowledge of appearances only and not of things in themselves. This sort of idealism has become very fashionable today. That was when he wrote this in the 50s. It even parades as extremely scientific when capitalism was still a progressive force. This is how from, from uh, the Marxists, capitalism was born as a progressive force, uh, uh, even though it wiped out whole peoples all around the world and enslaved uh, Africa, the whole continent of Africa and all of our people. But anyway, uh, back to Cornforth, he's trying to explain how idealism has become very uh, fashionable today and, and parades uh, as extremely scientific. And then he says, when capitalism was still a progressive force that is in Europe, bourgeois thinkers used to believe that we could know more and more about the real world and so control natural forces and improve the lot of mankind indefinitely. Now they are saying that the real world is unknowable. Uh, the area of the arena of mysterious forces which pass our comprehension. It is not difficult to see that the fashion for such doctrines uh, is uh, just a symptom of the decay of capitalism. This is what he said. We say it is a symptom of the fact that, uh, the, uh, that the social system is dying. It is a system of, of, of uh, 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 evidence of decay. Uh, but uh, it's different from how Cornforth understands it. Uh, you see, uh, in much of the United States uh, and much of Europe, uh, uh, all of it, you, you see that uh, there is nothing progressive that can be put forth. They, they talk about when capitalism was progressive. This is what he says. 
but the reality is that the thinking representatives of the ruling class, the philosophers and what have you, can't see a future beyond where they are today. And the only thing they do is rely on past glories and you know, uh, uh, and you see in the popular culture, superheroes and things like this, this is nostalgia uh, for a powerful imperialist of the imperialism of the past. And they'll even make some, to make it modern, they'll make some of the superheroes black and Asian uh, and, and indigenous to different places so that, so that uh, uh, this becomes acceptable uh, 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 as a substitute for the future. You're not looking at the future when you see this and see a Black Panther that's probably written and produced by the CIA in terms of movies. You're not seeing something progressive when you see that. You are seeing imperialism trying, unable to see the future explains itself based on, the, on its great past of conquest and things like that. And so uh, this is the expression of, of a Superman and and, and, and that white man and uh, all of these things are expressions of imperialism at, at when it was in its glory, when it was conquering the world and things like that. Uh, and now that's just one aspect of it. So they can't see, they can't, they, they, they can't see the future. What they see in terms of the future is made manifest in popular culture as vampires and, and zombies. And both vampires and zombies are like walking dead, uh, et cetera. And this is what they, they can't see uh, a future of life. They see a future of death and only the past they hold up as, and, and glorify it. And they make it even more glorious uh, by sometimes making an African a superhero of somebody else. Uh, but all of this, of course, uh, is, uh, uh, is a means by which uh, we can see a de declining uh, social system even uh, in, and that's incapable of explaining itself in that fashion. So uh, let's see, uh, where are we? So materialism and idealism are rec irreconcilably opposed. This is coined for. Uh, but this does not stop many philosophers from trying to reconcile them and combine them. In philosophy, there are, there are also uh, various uh, uh, attempted compromises between idealism and materialism. One such attempted compromise uh, is often known as dualism. Such a compromise uh, philosophy asserts the existence of the spiritual as separate and distinct from the material, but it tries to place the two on a level. Thus it treats the world of non-living matter in a thoroughly materialist way. This is to say, is the sphere of activity of natural forces and spiritual factors do not enter into it and have nothing to do with it in any way. But when it comes to mind and society here, says this philosophy is the sphere of activity of spirit. Here it maintain, maintains, we must seek explanations in the idealist and not in materialist terms. Um, such a compromise between materialism and idealism amounts to this, that with regard to all the most important questions concerning men, society, and history, we are to continue to adopt idealist conceptions and to oppose materialism. In the, in, uh, uh, in, with regard to all the most important questions concerning men, society, and history, we have to continue to adopt idealist conceptions as a and to oppose materialism. And such an idealist conception, of course, is racism. We're fighting against racism, an idealist conception, as opposed to materialism, which is colonialism, which is on the earth, which is a relationship between human beings where uh, 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 you have foreign and alien domination of a people to extract all the value and resources to dominate them. That's racism versus colonialism. Uh, and, and people, uh, you have this, this, this dualism so that, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, in fact, we've heard people say that the contradiction is racism and imperialism. The uh, one organization, the uh, AAPRP, used to always say, I don't know if they still do anymore, that, you know, we're dealing with racism and imperialism when uh, racism is simply ideas and, and imperialism represents itself in the real world. Colonialism is what we are talking about, uh, uh, et cetera. And so it's a compromise for lot. And, and, and another compromise philosophy, according to Cornforth here, is known as realism. 
uh, in its modern form, this philosophy has arisen in an opposition to subjective idealism. Remember subjective idealism, nothing exists except in our minds. The realist philosophers say that the external material world really exists independent of our perceptions and is in some way reflected by our perceptions. In this, the realists agree with the materialist in opposition to subjective idealism. Indeed, you cannot be a materialist unless you are thoroughgoing realist on the question of the real existence of the material world. But merely to assert the external world exists independent of our behavior, it is uh, not to be is not uh, it it is not to be materialist. For example, the great Catholic philosopher Thomas Aquinas of the Middle East Middle Age uh, was in this sense a realist. And to say and to this day, most Catholic theologians regard it as heresy to be anything but a quote unquote realist in philosophy. But at the same time, they assert that the material world, uh, which really exists, was created by God and is sustained and ruled by all the time by the power of God, by a spiritual force. So far from being materialists, they are idealists. Uh, and I think that's uh, uh, really, you know, like important uh, to recognize. Like, you know, even I think this whole thing that you will hear people say that uh, stuff like uh, that uh, uh, it was, well, let me leave it there for the time. Being. Uh, so uh, as for modern realism, it concedes to materialism the bare existence of matter, and for the rest is ready uh, to concede everything to idealism. Moreover, the word realism is much abused by philosophers. So long as you believe that something or other is real, you may call yourself a realist. Some philosophers think that not only is the world of material things real, but there is also outside space and time, a real world of universals of the abstract essence of things. So these call themselves realists. Others say that although nothing exists uh, but the perceptions uh, in our minds, nevertheless, these perceptions are real. So these call themselves realists too. All of which goes to show that some philosophers are very tricky in their use of words. I agree with that poem for. So uh, the basic teachings of materialism and, in opposition to idealism. Uh, and uh, uh, let me see where we are, uh, uh, comrade director. Uh, uh, give me some leadership of whether I should proceed or not. Uhuru, Chairman, um, because we're start, it starts as a new section, I think that we'd actually be good to start that section next week. Um, okay. So that's, uh, we're now on page what? This is, I believe, page 22, the basic teachings of materialism in opposition to idealism. Okay, I'm gonna uh, try to move uh, in our next sessions. I'm not gonna be so, you know, I'm not gonna elaborate so much. I'm gonna go through core and forth. I've hoped I've laid some kind of foundation for how to understand what we're looking at with core and forths and marks and what have you, and directing people uh, to African internationalism. Of course, they can find um, African internationalist uh, elaboration uh, uh, on the real world uh, from the political reports of, uh, you know, most recent uh, being Vanguard um, uh, that was written for our seventh Congress. And then I think uh, equally significant most recently uh, would be um, uh, Uneasy Equilibrium written for the sixth Congress where we do things, we talk about and give the philosophical basis, the, ideal, the ideological basis uh, for uh, discussion, the nation uh, and, and, and the theory of uh, African internationalism. So um, Uhuru, so let's move uh, with you, comrade uh, Akile. Uhuru, Chairman. Um, yeah, I just you know, wanna unite. I think that you've laid a great foundation uh, for this discussion and you know that this is an African, this is, discussion on African internationalism. So, you know, you've written about it extensively, so it doesn't end here. But um, yeah, I think just really salute this study and uh, appreciate your leadership. And uh, we are opening it up now for our Q&A uh, portion. So go ahead and type your questions or comments into the chat section of either Facebook or YouTube. And um, we'll try to get to those today. Um, and I'll, of course, we wanna start off with our announcements that you know what's going on um, in the movement. So if we get that up, awesome. All right, so 
This study is being brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, where we're winning the war of ideas for your, for your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis. You can visit theburningspear.com. And we encourage everyone watching today, if you have not already subscribed to the Burning Spear newspaper, get a one-year subscription today. 12 issues delivered straight to your door for $25 or the digital edition delivered to your email inbox. Get a combo of both for 20% off. You can also gift get a gift subscription for comrades and family members and donate to sponsor a prisoner subscription. You can do all of this at theburningspur.com slash subscribe. Next. All right. And it's always the season for giving the gift of African internationalism. Visit burningspermarketplace.com for books and literature by Chairman Amalia Shetela and other Uhuru movement leaders. Check out the pamphlet section with reissued and vintage pamphlets, including The New Period and Smash Slander, which have been discussed in previous Omali Taught Me studies and Report from the Mountain. These are critical African internationalist texts that are still relevant today. Check out the new Thinking About Uhuru hat and stock up on your African flags. Go to burningspearmarketplace.com. Next. Calling on the spear distributors, the November spears are here. So get the spear out in your community. Burningspearmarketplace.com is also the place to order your spear bundles. <clears throat> Omali Taught Me airs on Black Power 96 FM Radio, a project of the African People's Education and Defense Fund, with the slogan, not just explaining the world, but changing it. Listen on 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida, or streaming online at blackpower96.org and on the free Black Power 96 mobile app. The theory of African internationalism is a theory of practice. All the energy of the African People's Socialist Party is focused on the destruction of colonial capitalism. Africans of the world go to our website, apspuhuru.org and fill out our contact form. The Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace and Reparations is holding its annual rally, March on the White House and Conference on November 6th and 7th, 2021. Join us in deepening the struggle against police terror and honoring our political prisoners and prisoners of war. Learn more and register at blackisbackcoalition.org. So that's this upcoming weekend, the Black is Back March on the White House, blackisbackcoalition.org to register. And again, order... Oh. I'm sorry, like and follow the Louisa Kinshasa like page on Facebook for more African internationalist political education. Secretary General Louisa Kinshasa does frequent live events such as the War of Ideas series. He includes live sessions done in French. To get alerts of when SG Louisa is going live, make sure to like and follow his page today. Tune in to the White Lies Shattered series of the Reparations in Action podcast featuring Penny Hess, chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee, along with the Hru Solidarity Movement chair, Jesse Neville, and host, Jamie Simpson. Check out the show Fridays at 3 p.m. Eastern on Black Power 96 Radio and on demand at ahurusolidarity.podbean.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is a series that challenges and exposes the distortion of history by the colonial ruling class and reveals the truth about the past, present, and future from the eyes of the African working class. Uhuru Foods and Pies is hiring for a part-time baker in both Oakland, California and St. Petersburg, Florida. Culinary training is preferred. Join the work to build an independent African economy by baking for Black Power. To apply, email your resume to oakland.volunteer at uhurufoods.org or mail your resume into 7911 MacArthur Boulevard, Oakland, California, 94605 or call 800 578 5157 for more information. Uhuru Furniture and Collectibles in both Oakland and Philly are hiring full-time truck drivers and full-time marketing coordinators. Do you have driving and furniture lifting skills, social media and print marketing experience, and can you work Wednesday through Sunday? If so, apply for these positions and contribute your labor and skills to this institution of the African People's Education and Defense Fund. Apply by visiting their website in Oakland, ahurufurniture.blogspot.com, and in Philadelphia, that's ahurufurniturephilly.blogspot.com. On Tuesday nights from 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern, join Ralph Pointer on What's Happening Blog Talk Radio. Tune in by calling 347-857-3293. Ralph Pointer sits on the Black is Back Coalition Steering Committee and chairs the BIBC's Political Prisoners Working Group and also leads the Lynn Stewart Committee. 
And we are calling on people to follow the Old African People's Development and Empowerment Project on Facebook or visit developmentforafrica.org for important information and helpful tips in regards to the colonial virus COVID-19. You can access APDEP's International Telehealth Program to get your COVID-19 related questions and concerns answered by licensed doctors and nurses through Project Black Onc. Make your free virtual appointment with one of their professional health providers by going to developmentforafrica.org slash telehealth. And to keep up with our movement events, visit the burningspur.com's events page and subscribe to our mailing list. And make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spur TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Omali Tommy Sunday Study. The Burning Spur channel has almost reached 10,000 subscribers. So if you're not subscribed yet, do it now to get notified whenever we go live. And support the Omali Taught Me show by donating now at paypal.me slash Omali Taught Me. So that's it for our announcements. Thank you, engineer. And now we're going to get into the Q&A segment of our um, of the study. We do have questions from last week to take and want to acknowledge where people are watching from. Battle Creek, Michigan, St. Louis, Missouri, St. Petersburg, Florida, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Chicago, Illinois, San Diego, California, Oakland, California, Portland, Oregon, Fort Myers, Florida, Kona Cree, Guinea, Los Angeles, California, Hawaii, Sierra Leone, Occupied Azania or South Africa, Swaziland, Harlem, New York, Lawrenceville, Georgia, Bermuda, Lynn, Massachusetts, Richmond, Virginia, Atlanta, Georgia, Lakeland, Florida, Hinesville, Georgia, Hempstead, New York, Durham, North Carolina, and Huntsville, Alabama. So thank you guys for tuning in wherever you are located. And we're going to go ahead and get into our Q&A. Um, this first question comes from Anthony Carew, chairman from last week, and asks, is there any African head of state that doesn't match the bill of a neocolonialist? You know, no, the, the, the fact is uh, <coughs> neocolonialism is not uh, simply, you know, uh, like a, a bad act or a bad person. It describes an actual relationship <clears throat> and it describes a, a phenomenon uh, where the colonizer has disguised and hidden uh, himself. And uh, while he has, uh, you know, uh, get, made a lot of fanfare with uh, ending colonial domination, uh, leaving uh, the obvious trappings of power so there's not this direct uh, control of uh, African people. Uh, they continue to control uh, Africa, African people, globe in various places around the world uh, through control of the economy. So uh, that's why often neocolonialism is referred to as flag independence. You got a flag, but you really don't have freedom because the colonizer can still controls the economy. And I think it's important while seeing, and so, uh, and then there are human beings who uh, volunteer themselves to uh, to as neo-colonists, to be over the rest of us, to accept the existing social system and just uh, uh, fight for a place to, uh, to, uh, 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 to function within it. Uh, that's what uh, Du Bois' talented 10th was. He, the objective is to fight for the so-called talented 10th percent of the black community, the educated, et cetera, uh, to be recognized as the leaders uh, of the rest of us in this relationship that it would have to white power. Even Toussaint Louverture, in many ways, uh, in Haiti, uh, was, was uh, offering France that kind of deal. And of course, it took Dessalines, who understood much better that the way you get rid of this thing is to cut off their heads and burn down their houses. Uh, uh, so, so you have people who are neocolonialists who volunteer for that position, but they're neocolonialists because of the existence of neocolonialism. And neocolonialism is the system itself. It is, it is not uh, the eradication of colonialism. By the very term, it showed it's neo, it's a new colonialism that we're looking at. And this new colonialism is simply the old colonialism that has disguised itself. There's a man uh, who out of England, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, he was called Lord uh, something this way, uh, uh, who, who was the really the one who developed this whole concept of indirect rule. And uh, that is what we characterize as neocolonialism. So there is no uh, uh, African leader that I can think of. I, we saw those who have attempted to do it, like and most recently, Tomas Sankara, uh, in Burkina Faso, uh, who tried to break out of it, 
but he was in so many ways isolated by a number of factors uh, and of course was assassinated uh, by a henchman of the French uh, uh, neo-colonial force uh, who, 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 who preferred uh, to have uh, a leadership uh, um, in a neo-colonial relationship as opposed to the people coming to power. So no, I can't point uh, uh, to any uh, comrade. Um, comrade, uh, is that Karu? Anthony yeah. Karu, yeah, Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Anthony, for your question. Uh, we move to uh, Dwight, who uh, submitted a question on Facebook, said, if you can, at this time, please give us a brief dialectical materialist analysis of why the Soviets in Russia succeeded in 1917, while the Soviets in Germany fell to attacks by the Freikorp right-wing militia, which led to the victory of fascist Nazism in World War II. Well, you know, uh, first thing, I wanted to go back and say that even, uh, uh, historical materialist uh, uh, explanation of this relationship, the emergence of capitalism itself as a social system, uh, presupposed that the historical basis for the rise of communism uh, was, was uh, uh, with, with the historical basis for the rise of communism was the exhaustion of the, uh, the capitalist uh, uh, production, productive process or the development under the capitalist system itself that pre Pre, that made it necessary uh, for different mode of production to come into place uh, in order to deal with the contradiction between the race, relations of production and the actual uh, forces of production uh, that, that was there. And, uh, uh, and that presupposes a contradiction being resolved within uh, the European society itself between uh, uh, the uh, the the, the uh, industrial working class versus ruling class, and of course Russia was an anomaly. It did not meet those requirements because there was no high de highly developed uh, uh, capitalist uh, system in Russia, uh, and it was only belatedly that Lenin uh, had. To, in fact, many of the members of the Communist Party uh, in Russia refused uh, to follow Lenin to seize power because they said it defied. Uh, Marx's understanding of the need for the contradiction inside capitalism to, uh, to uh, actually uh, ripen and from there emerge a, a different uh, social system that is communism. And so they said that Russia uh, uh, is not, uh, is, is a, a semi uh, a feudal state uh, that's uh, just achieving cap capitalist uh, process, et cetera. And uh, we have to wait to capitalism, you know, reaches a certain form of development before we can. And this was based on uh, on the Marxist um, assumption of the uh, uh, the vertical, you know, development of human society, moving from the from the lower uh, to the higher. In this instance, from capitalism to colonialism through a natural kind of uh, uh, of progression and the resolution of contradictions existing inside that society. But it didn't happen that way. And what made the difference was Lenin and uh, uh, the organization of the, uh, of the Communist Party under various kinds of principles and fighting for it. And, and uh, uh, this was a fundamental thing that made the difference, of course. Uh, and, and so then the existence of the Bolsheviks, uh, the, uh, this, this was a fundamental difference that I can say. And, but beyond that, I can say, uh, uh, that uh, all of what they talked about uh, minimized or uh, underestimated or did not recognize the significance of the struggle against colonialism that was the foundation for the whole capitalist system. So if anything, what we see that happened in Russia was an anomaly, uh, which is I think the point that uh, Dwight is making that similar thing did not happen in Germany. Uh, we, uh, so that's an aspect, that's a short, a kind of response to it, Dwight. There's much more that we can say about it in terms of the contradictions that existed uh, in Germany, the contending forces there, uh, the fact that in Germany you had uh, the successful rise of, of the successful existence of uh, an influence of what would be characterized as the yellow international where they were actually socialists, uh, socialists so anyway, that was in that direction. And Lenin waged serious struggles 
against the manifestation of, uh, of uh, the opportunism in the ranks of the, of a, uh, of the European communist movement. And that struggle uh, did not have the same kind of intensity and success uh, in Germany as it did in Russia under Lenin's uh, uh, leadership, Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman, and thank you Dwight for your question. And we move it to Comrade Denzel in San Diego, California, who says, Uhuru, this is Comrade Denzel out of San Diego. Appreciate the in-depth analysis, Chairman. Why are we fighting as revolutionaries instead of reformists or modern day abolitionists? Let me just say uh, again, uh, Brother Dwight, uh, you know that that struggle in Germany uh, got to be uh, really serious in terms of fighting, you know, like for, uh, to make a uh, communist revolution and the party in Germany. We saw uh, the Germans uh, execute uh, people uh, uh, like uh, Liefnick and uh, Rosenberg uh, who fell uh, to the repression uh, there. We saw uh, a highly divided uh, communist movement uh, throughout Europe, uh, many of them who were actively engaged in fighting against uh, the type of uh, struggle that Lenin advanced, and perhaps many of them falling victim uh, to the notion that uh, uh, communism could come only after the development of, uh, of uh, capitalism uh, had uh, led to uh, that place. Uh, I think it's important also to recognize that Lenin knew uh, that uh, the Russian Revolution uh, 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 was, extra was extremely limited in terms of uh, leading to a communist uh, outcome and had and was waiting and, and anticipating, expecting, hoping for uh, the uh, a revolution, especially in Germany, a highly industrialized Germany. They, they saw that was necessary and Lenin recognized uh, that uh, the Russian revolution could not be successful without revolution uh, taking off or assume that revolution in Germany and, and Russia could not be successful without a revolution, uh, a communist revolution becoming universal uh, uh, in, in Europe and particularly uh, in, in, in Germany. Uh, so I just wanted to add to that, uh, Dwight Uhuru. And you were saying that Denzel was saying, raising the question of why aren't we just fighting for reforms and what else? Why are we revolutionaries rather than reformists or modern day abolitionists? Yeah, thank you. Uh, because. Uh, the objective uh, is, the thing is that African internationalism teaches us that the uh, contradiction is in the nature of the social system itself. Uh, that uh, to become reformers, to try to improve uh, a social system of oppression and exploitation is not the same as trying to end a social system of oppression and exploitation. And revolutionaries, uh, African internationalists have set for ourselves the goal of destroying it, to wiping it out. And this uh, demands a different kind of relationship than simply uh, 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 trying to reform uh, uh, that system. And the other thing is that our objective is not to be some kind of modern day abolitionist, which presupposes that, uh, uh, that the, the problems, uh, the suffering, the contradictions that Africans and oppressed people around the world and in the United States uh, experience uh, can, can come short, again, short of the destruction of the social system a social system that even makes the concept of abolition uh, necessary. So uh, 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 Denzel, that's why we, we are not uh, reformists. We, to say we're not reformists doesn't mean that uh, we reject the reform. Uh, we just see that reform is not uh, the end of what it is that we're fighting for and reform for us is only helpful and meaningful if that reform uh, uh, puts us on a a uh, conscious uh, uh, trajectory toward overturning the system itself. It puts us in a better place for the destruction of the system. So uh, I hope that responded effectively, uh, Denzel. Uhura. Uhura, Chairman, thank you. And thank you, Denzel, for your question. And our last question from last week, Chairman, came from Comrade Timba, um, who asked, Uhura, Chairman, can you explain Colin Powell's death and how we as colonized Africans should respond to it? Oh, that was one that was kind of tough. <laughs> I mean, uh, when you say explain his death, well, one, it shows that he was immortal, uh, which was a precondition for being able to, for being able to die. 
but the response to it is, uh, I think for revolutionaries uh, to say how African people should respond to it. I think that African people will respond to it based on uh, a recognition of who Colin Powell was as an instrument of colonial white power. A, a global instrument, a terrorist, uh, uh, who even according to uh, bourgeois rules uh, should be considered a war criminal, uh, somebody who uh, uh, voluntarily uh, offered his face uh, as justification uh, for the uh, war, the murder of people, uh, in, you know, like in, 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 in uh, uh, Iraq, uh, it functioned as a, someone who, uh, facilitated the uh, uh, war in Afghanistan, had played a similar role uh, against oppressed and colonized people uh, in Iran. Uh, he was no friend of ours. And in fact, what happened was he was a tool of imperialism, a kind of neo-colonial uh, tool of imperialism. He was white power and black face. And because he looked like the colonizer in the same way Obama, who was one of the most vicious uh, 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 tools of our uh, oppression uh, that has existed. Well, I put him hand in glove with Nelson Mandela uh, in South Africa. Uh, uh, the fact is that he, uh, because he looked like the colonizer, because people didn't have a, an African internationalist ability, a historical materialist, dialect historical materialist to understand who this guy was, uh, he, uh, he was believable, uh, that is power. Uh, when at the United Nations, uh, he, uh, in this televised uh, presentation, uh, offered up uh, the so-called evidence of, uh, of uh, there being uh, uh, a capacity uh, to uh, engage uh, uh, with this uh, uh, highly developed uh, war uh, from, uh, from Iraq and uh, weapons of mass destruction as they characterized Powell did that. And, uh, and what, what we've learned, of course, we know from our own history in this world uh, that Africans, generally speaking, are not trusted by the colonizers. The oppressed, generally speaking, not trusted by the colonizers. They do all kinds of stuff to, uh, to, uh, to control our brains and what have you, but good Africans, good Negroes are the highest, uh, they are exemplary and uh, the most believable forces in the world. And they are rewarded for being good Negroes and, and, and uh, like selling insurance, you know, uh, uh, you have people, uh, how does it go? Uh, something about, uh, uh, about uh, all state insurance, you know, you're in good hands with all state, uh, as opposed to being able to say you were in good hands with our state uh, as African people, but that becomes a real selling insurance because the black person has said it. And you can't find a more trustworthy human being uh, than a good Negro. And Colin Powell played that role and Obama played that role on the world stage and what have you. Even people like Hugo Chavez, uh, revered uh, by many uh, people around the world, um, greeted Obama's uh, a selection by White Powell, giving him a book uh, on uh, the murder of the indigenous people of the Americas. And even uh, Libya's uh, Gaddafi, you know, sort of uh, saw him uh, as uh, some uh, really important figure uh, leading to uh, contributing to our, our, our liberation. Uh, 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 Colin Powell was a traitor. Uh, and I think Harry Belafonte, uh, is one who I think uh, characterized Powell as a Buffalo soldier or something to that effect. And people with uh, some understanding of that history recognize that the Buffalo soldiers fought for white people, white power uh, in, uh, against the indigenous people uh, of the Americas and became noted uh, warriors uh, killing for white people and white power. So uh, Timber, uh, you can raise your flag to red, black, and green uh, to its full height on the mast. Uh, you don't have to lower it uh, in memory of Colin Powell, Uhuru. That's a joke, Tim, but I know you wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Uhuru Chairman, <laughs> thank you, Timba, for your question. <laughs> All right, so we are uh, finished with the questions from last week, Chairman, so we're gonna dive into those that have come in today. And um, we have a question from Comrade Life who asked uh, in Tampa, Florida, who asked her chairman, definitely appreciate this discussion. Can you say something about why some Africans have difficulty distinguishing lessons in folklore, such as those featured in some Bible stories from literal lessons expressed in material reality? 
Well, you know, the thing that about materialism as, as opposed to uh, idealism, materialism, uh, wanting to understand the world investigates the world. Idealist, uh, 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 for example, wanting to explain the world uh, might uh, go to the Bible. And you can go to the Bible and learn a, a lot about what's in the Bible, but doesn't necessarily explain to you the world. And I think that's the, that's the thing that we're looking at. That's the struggle that we're involved in right now, Comrade Life, why it's the work and the way we will do work more effectively moving forward is to take a, a dialectical materialist, a historical materialist uh, uh, understanding to masses of our people to uh, push uh, out of the prominence that they have, the preachers and the politicians and the, and the hustlers and careerists uh, who would misdirect uh, the masses of African people to a recognition of reality to raise up uh, African internationalism as the worldview of the masses of African people, that's our job. And when I say this, uh, I hope I'm not sounding like uh, I'm talking about something that would be difficult in terms of convincing African people. In fact, it's natural. What has happened to us is an intervention by a colonial capitalist system uh, that uh, has dispossessed us of our own consciousness in a certain way and has replaced the worldview uh, that uh, is inherent in the relationship that human beings have to nature and, and, and replaced that with this idealistic view uh, that uh, comes from the oppressor so that we cannot see our way forward. So life, that's our responsibility as organizers and uh, on the ground, every place we are and using every method and means that we have uh, to take uh, uh, an historical materialist and African internationalist uh, uh, perception uh, uh, into the world. And we do this in a thousand different ways. As Comrade Director Akili would tell you, uh, we do it with cultural expressions uh, and we are relatively effective uh, in doing that even though we are concentrating now uh, much more uh, of our efforts and attention to that direction. And, and we do it like we are doing uh, right now, Uhuru. Thank you, Carmen Life. Uhuru Life, thank you for your question. Thank you, Chairman. Excuse me. All right, so our next question uh, comes from Comrade Leia in, um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, asks Uhuru Chairman, thank you for this informative study. I apologize, apologize if this question comes across as clumsy or unclear. How do you understand the struggle for Black power being tied to the land of the U.S. and the coexisting struggle of indigenous nations of the U.S. to reclaim their land often expressed in the call for land back. Can these struggles coexist? Are there any contradictions present in the African struggle for land and power when this happens on the land of indigenous peoples? Well, there, there, yeah, there, there are contradictions there, but I don't think they have to be fundamental contradictions. Um, the fact is that the indigenous people and African people are, all live under colonialism. We refer to the indigenous people as suffering uh, immediately from settler colonialism, where the colonizer has left uh, uh, his own country and come uh, to a place and settled there, uh, as opposed to uh, what had been recognized or assumed to be traditional colonialism by Europeans anyway, uh, where the colonizer would go to a place uh, and would be there uh, simply for the purpose of extracting wealth and value and sending it back to a mother country in Europe. Now, what happened is these enterprising uh, thugs, colonizers who were coming and killing and stealing for Europe came and said, hey, why don't we come and keep what we've uh, stole uh, and, uh, uh, and killed for, for ourselves. And independence movement uh, throughout Europe, America, throughout America and the Americas emerged uh, through that process. Same thing happened in Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. So they stole uh, these resources and they occupied the people's land as settlers. Africans, uh, of course, were captured uh, and brought here. I'm not getting into the argument at this point about whether Africans were here thousands of years ago and a long time, et cetera. That's not the point because Europe came to power, Europeans came to power, not through dispossession of African people who came here a thousand years ago, but through dispossession of indigenous people who lived uh, in this territory. Massive uh, uh, crimes of what has been defined as genocide uh, 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 were initiated. Their whole peoples don't exist anymore throughout the Americas. And so 
fundamental to the struggle of the indigenous people has always been the recapture of our land. Land is a fundamental issue. People need the land, must have the land. Uh, to, and and, and the, the, the history and culture of the people uh, connected to the land. The land holds the memory of peoples and things like that. So that's fundamental, that's important. And uh, uh, part of what has happened with African people is uh, that our perception of the world has been, uh, has been uh, truncated, has been limited and, and shrunken uh, by uh, 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 our relationship uh, to colonial capitalism so that you know, we live in this country and in the United States in this instance for a long period of time. Uh, we built some houses here, we did some farming here, we went to prison here, people are buried in various places here. So there is a connection there and that's clear. But both the indigenous uh, 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 people and African people uh, live under colonial domination. And the indigenous people must necessarily, the struggle must necessarily uh, be informed by the struggle to take back their land. They must have their land. The argument, of course, has come from certain Africans who want the same land uh, that uh, uh, who, we live here, we worked here, we built on it, et cetera, et cetera. The argument has come, uh, uh, one argument, uh, of course, is that, uh, uh, that there are only a few uh, uh, indigenous people left that escaped the, 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 uh, the essence of the genocide, and therefore, uh, we have a right uh, to claim as our own as a fundamental right to claim it was our own, uh, some uh, uh, part of this land as African land that in fact, they, some claim uh, that a whole new nation has emerged uh, uh, on this land of African people that they characterize as new Africans or that some have characterized as a Negro nation and things like that. And the fact of course is that uh, our responsibility as revolutionaries and especially as the advanced detachment of the revolutionary movement of African people is to, to recognize that the, the legitimate and just struggle of the indigenous people to take back their land, to recognize that the national homeland of African people is Africa. It is not uh, New Jersey, uh, it, is, uh, it is Africa itself. And that fundamentally the whole co-capitalist system while it, it enriched itself and built itself and developed itself on the land of indigenous peoples uh, in what we now characterize uh, in the Americas and some other places, fundamental to the emergence of capitalism was the uh, assault on Africa. One, the assault on Africa, the theft of African resources, both uh, material and human, uh, and the dispersal of African people around the world. Here's where you have the origin uh, of this whole uh, social system. So we unite. Uh, with the indigenous people and the struggle to take back their land. And we also uh, do so in a fashion that we do not claim this land as some natural, uh, historically derived uh, 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 development in terms of, uh, you know, this our land because we lived here for a long time. Uh, we, we say this because there must be, to get power, it's based on objective uh, reality, objective capture of territory land to deny access to that land to whom? Not to the indigenous people, but to the colonizer. And so that we can function on this land, we can build on this land in relationship to uh, the indigenous people who are fighting to take back their resources. And, and I think that we acknowledge that in the African People's Sources Party, that a national homeland of black people is Africa. And that this land that we function on today is the land of the indigenous people where we fight here on this land. And we also recognize that the African revolution, uh, though having its origin in Africa, is also a part of the revolution of the Americas, of the indigenous peoples here. So we don't separate the struggle of African people from the struggle of the indigenous people in that fashion that we're going to take your land as our land because it's due to us because we worked here for a long time. Uh, we say that there's a unity in this struggle against colonialism and that uh, 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 and this, this is how we function. This is how we are motivated. So there should not come and will not come from the African People's Socialist Party a position uh, that presupposes uh, that the land here is uh, on this in, in the Americas is fundamentally the land of black people as opposed to the land of the indigenous people who suffer even today in concentration camps called Indian reservations as a consequence of the theft of that land and the imposition 
of a colonial, uh, of settler colonialism. I hope that was, that was helpful, Leah. But the thing is, comrade, that this struggle continues to unfold and how it looks moving forward will depend on a lot of things. And, and most uh, significantly, I think will depend on the kind of leadership that comes uh, uh, from advanced detachment uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the efforts to build an actual um, a material unity recognition of this unity between uh, the indigenous peoples and African people uh, who are engaged in struggle, not only here, throughout the Americas and the world. The African revolution uh, uh, is a part of the uh, revolution of the Americas. It's not separate from that. And uh, how, some, how it would define itself in some ways, we cannot say. We know that it's going to be absolutely necessary that we know that it's absolutely uh, necessary that land is an, is, is an aspect of this uh, uh, because you can't take power uh, in, in cyberspace as quiet as it's kept for many of the social media uh, militants and, uh, uh, and, and the struggle for power uh, occupies time and space and we have to uh, be able uh, to move that way. Materialism uh, uh, requires that of us and of us and dialectics require us to recognize the relationship that we have uh, with the, uh, the indigenous people, the oppressor, the land, and what have you uh, in the process of, of making this revolution, moving the struggle forward. Leah, I, I, I hope this was helpful. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. Absolutely. And Leah commented, uh, thank you so very much, Chairman. I appreciate your thorough response. And as do I, um, Uhuru. So uh, Chairman, we're like, just at the end, I want to see if we could take at least one more question. We do have a couple more left, but um, this one came from Comrade Kabula um, in Chicago, Illinois. And he asked, when it comes to gaining confidence, how can we be as materialist as possible? Could there be dangers in being confident, but idealist? Okay, I didn't understand the last part of that, dangers in being confident by idealist. Conf confident. Um, Hmm. How do we gain confidence? Let me just say this, uh, because I saw another question in the chat, I think, relating to how one can become like materialists uh, uh, in the struggle, how we learn to do this. And that's an important question, how we learn to do it. We, uh, because everything uh, about the system that we live on that drives us in the direction of idealism uh, as a means of, of, uh, of, of uh, uh, explaining uh, the world, drives us toward and, and punishes us if we move in materialist direction. We move against uh, 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 colonialism, then the police come, the army comes, they attack us in this fashion on the one hand, while on the other hand, the materialists are given greater credibility because we've been killed, we've been assassinated and violated, and we have the idealists who will say, see, I told you, we were correct, this way to do this, because look at Malcolm is dead, and you know these other forces are dead because they fought against colonialism. So, but what has to happen, uh, 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 Comrade Kabul, is that it is a part of a process of struggle uh, that you have to uh, come uh, into uh, the party, into the revolutionary project. You have to become African internationalists. You have, we have to, as, uh, as uh, uh, oppressed and exploited people, have, have to have our own philosophy that opposes the philosophy of oppression. And if we do not have such a philosophy, we always end up borrowing uh, the philosophy of the oppressor. So we come into a revolutionary project. We engage uh, in struggle and organization with other materialists. Well, uh, on and a part of the process of making the struggle uh, in these organ in our organization, uh, based on the rules that we have in the organizations, which are designed to drive us into materialist uh, direction toward materialist uh, approaches to things, uh, as opposed to idealism, uh, which uh, drives us to a dialectical or historical materialist approach to things. Uh, that's why we have certain structures in our organization. That's why we try to take these structures out into the world, the way we organize in our communities, the way we fight for uh, and build uh, things like black uh, uh, power, uh, 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 black power uh, 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 projects, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, economic ventures, they're all uh, tied uh, to uh, historical materialist worldview. And we bring masses of people into this 
And this is part of the process of masses of people uh, being able to recapture uh, a way of looking at the world that we had before the white man uh, colonizer imposed uh, systems uh, that, uh, uh, that taught us to see things differently and that would kill us and oppress us and put us in jail if we said things uh, that they didn't like. This is why Facebook and other entities like that are controlling uh, how what people can hear and understanding. And of course, as it's not successful uh, because even cyberspace is space, is out of space of a certain sort. But the real world is what we have to capture. Uh, Comrade Kabula, in our neighborhoods and communities, we have to be organizers. We have to be out there with our propaganda. We have to be creating uh, institutionalized capacity for massive people to come to different conclusions through programs and initiatives that we put forward uh, to solve practical problems to deal with the uh, consequence of colonial domination. I hope that was uh, helpful, Kabula. Uh, but it's a matter of practice involved in solving material contradictions. That's why there are rules of discipline and things like that that we create, just as the oppressor has created ways that funnel and reward and punish uh, people uh, and groups uh, who moved uh, away from idealism uh, toward a materialist conclusion, away from racism toward uh, 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 an understanding of colonialism, away from from Jesus or some other superstition uh, toward uh, recognition of the real conditions in the world responsible for our oppression. So uh, uh, Kabula, you know, that's, that's what it is that we do. And you will be seeing this more and more uh, come at Kabula because you're responsible for a lot of the work that we do in Chicago. And you will be seeing in the coming uh, several days uh, and certainly within the next couple of weeks, um, how the party is organizing, reinforcing certain uh, processes and things like that, uh, that will contribute uh, to our ability to make the struggle more effectively on the ground where we are located uh, in the world and other places. So Uhuru, thank you so much. I just wanted to recognize and appreciate, uh, I think this is the first I've seen the comrades from Swaziland uh, who participated uh, here and from Guinea, uh, Konakri. I'm glad to see uh, you uh, here as well, comrades. Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru Chairman. And uh, thank you, Kabula, for your question. And Chairman, that will uh, wrap us up for today. Any closing remarks before I go ahead and end it? Just uh, calling on people to really look at this question of historical materialism, dialectic and historical materialism, and don't expect to understand everything all the time uh, that quick to do it any damn way. Because as you engage in the work, uh, what will happen is these ideas will gain greater clarity. Study African internationalism, study uh, uh, Vanguard, uh, the re uh, political report to the seventh and then uh, uneasy equilibrium, the political report to the sixth Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. Uhuru, thank you so much. Uhuru Chairman, I just really want to salute you and appreciate your leadership and the study on dialectical materialism, which is really the study of African internationalism. Um, so thank you all for tuning in, um, no matter where you're watching from, especially the locations that Chairman shouted out, uh, the comrades in those areas. Um, but thank you for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spirit TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Amali Taught Me Sunday study. And don't worry if your question was not taken, we will look at it. Um, and not next Sunday, because because we'll be at Black is Back, but the um, the following Sunday, Amali um, Taught Me Sunday study. And continue to support the Amali Taught Me show by donating to paypal.me slash Amali Taught Me. Uhuru comrades, see you guys at Black is Back or in our uh, next Sunday study. Uhuru.